Does the world as a whole possess the value and meaning that we constantly attribute to certain parts of it, such as human beings and their works? And, if so, what is the nature of that value and meaning? This is a question which, a few years ago, I should not even have posed. For, like so many of my contemporaries, I took it for granted that there was no meaning. This was partly due to the fact that I shared the common belief that the scientific picture of an abstraction of reality was a true picture of reality as a whole, partly also to other non-intellectual reasons. I had motives for not wanting the world to have a meaning, consequently assumed that it had none, and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. For myself, as, no doubt for most of my contemporaries, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. The liberation we desired was simultaneously liberation from a certain political and economic system and liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. We objected to the political and economic system because it was unjust. The supporters of these systems claimed that in some way they embodied the meaning, a Christian meaning they insisted, of the world. There was one admirably simple method of confuting these people and at the same time justifying ourselves in our political and erotic revolt. We could deny that the world had any meaning whatsoever. Meanwhile, however, the nature of things seems to have so constituted the human mind that it is extremely reluctant to accept such a conclusion, except under the pressure of desire or self-interest. Furthermore, those who, to be liberated from political or sexual restraint, except the doctrine of absolute meaninglessness, tend in a short time to become so much dissatisfied with their philosophy, in spite of the services it renders, that they will exchange it for any dogma, however nonsensical, which restores meaning if only to a part of the universe. I use the terms chance and nature to represent two sides of humanism, sides which are mutually exclusive and which consequently produce some profound inconsistencies. I call them the dark side or pessimistic side and the bright or optimistic side. The dark side or chance side of humanism is the logical conclusion when working from the foundation of materialism. A logical consequence of materialism and chance is the idea that reality is fundamentally amoral. What does amoral mean? It's not a word used that often. Let's think of it in terms of two other words more commonly used, moral and immoral. When we say a person is a moral person, we mean there's a standard outside of the person which the person conforms their life to. When we say a person is an immoral person, we mean there's a standard outside of the person which the person does not conform their life to. Amoral simply means there's no standard for anyone to conform their life to. So if a person is said to be amoral, it means they don't appear to live their life according to any standard. This can't actually be done, so the force of the word is lessened somewhat when it's used in this context. In colloquial terms, if a person is said to be amoral, the intention is probably to say they're very immoral, perhaps unfeeling, without compassion, showing no sympathy to victims, unmoved by the plight of others, apparently without conscience. The full force of the word, however, is there is no standard. There is no morality, full stop. Any appearance that morality exists is only an appearance. It's not real. Most evolutionists don't use the appearance-only idea in public in regards to morality because they want to claim for propaganda purposes that they can be as good, moral, upright as any person who believes in God. 
that they really are moral, not just appear to be moral. However, they do use the appearance-only argument in regards to design in the world. They say that any appearance of design is only an appearance. It's not real. Even though things look designed, they weren't. In an amoral world, nothing can be said to be really, truly right or wrong. You can only say it is. That is, you can give a descriptive statement or a statement about something's existence, but not one about whether it ought to be one way or another. Actually, within an amoral world, which is also inherently a meaningless world, you can't even give a legitimate descriptive statement. Because for it to be legitimate, it would have to have meaning. But as there's no meaning in such a world, all meaningful statements aren't actually meaningful. They only appear to be so. Dogs mating on the footpath in the broad light of day aren't thought to be doing any wrong. Whereas if a couple of humans did the same, there would still be, I think, an outcry against it. Or at least there would be discussion and moral comment in society about the acceptability or appropriateness of such behaviour. Just as there was when a totally naked woman was sexually stimulated with a sex toy as a demonstration in a psychology class at Northwestern University in the US. The resulting discussion was global, with the event being a top news story for several days. Why the difference? Because dogs are amoral. They don't function in terms of morality. Humans do. Interestingly, the original report I heard about the sex toy incident was totally devoid of moral comment. It was simply descriptive. Of course, some who believe this philosophy may have promiscuously copulated in the street in broad daylight as a statement that life is amoral and that they're no more than bodies, material stuff, effectively no more than dogs. I imagine that's what motivated psychology professor J. Michael Bailey to arrange the sex toy demonstration in his class. Some, I'm sure, have portrayed themselves as devoid of feelings and apparently without conscience for the same reason. Some do such things with no thought of philosophy, having simply imbibed the philosophical materialism and amorality from their cultural environment. And there have been times in history when such behaviour has been more acceptable than others. However, even the most debauched society still has within it things that are not thought to be acceptable. The most depraved sexual exhibitionism and conduct can parade down our streets or be viewed in classrooms, and that's okay. But call someone a nigger or have a smoke in a no smoking zone and all hell breaks loose. Even Professor J. Michael Bailey seemed surprised that his sex toy demonstration was a top news story during, as he said, a time of financial crisis, war and global warming, which hints at things he values and indicates where his loyalties lie. A clear illustration of this philosophic amorality was expressed in a commentary in, in Wellington's daily paper, the Dominion Post. Joe Bennett is a humorous writer with the following, but he got relatively serious when commenting regarding Dr. Craig Venters inserting some artificially copied DNA in a bacterium. Bennett was having a go at what he called moralists, who he predicted would cry, whoa, whoa, over this making of life in a test tube. He said in part, Evolution is free of both morals and moralists. Only the fittest survive, normally by knocking something less fit off its perch. The fittest, in other words, does not mean the nicest. It means the most efficient and the meanest. We, for example, have only survived in this world because we are clever enough to be mean. We kill anything that threatens us. And if evolution is the survival of the meanest, the most selfish, the baddest asses, then Dr. Venter's research will survive and prosper for the very simple reason that there may be an awful lot of money in it. It's worth noting that Bennett finds himself compelled to use moral terms, the meanest, the most selfish, the baddest asses, to describe what he has just said is amoral. Also, I wonder if nice, comfortable, middle-class Joe Bennett has ever considered how his statements could be used to justify a holocaust, the murder and mayhem carried out by any of a raft of tyrants and the actions of any petty criminal, bad asses, in his hometown, who, according to him are the evolutionary fit ones. 
He was a high school teacher. I wonder how he would have responded to pupils acting in his class on the basis of his published amorality. And couldn't they have had a field day pointing out his inconsistency if he insisted they behave themselves? I said earlier, it's actually impossible to live amorally. And in this regard, a popular mistake is made by many Christians or moralists of different shades. Moralists being people who, while not being Christian, hold to some Christian-type ethic or traditional standard, which assumes for them the role of a higher law. You often hear such people bewailing a loss of moral values, the implication being that a move has occurred from a state of morality to one where there's no morality. The only loss there may have been is the loss of a certain type of morality. What's actually occurring is a change in morality. To think it acceptable to promiscuously copulate in the streets in broad daylight or have sexual stimulation actually demonstrated in a psychology class is a moral view, though different to one that says such behavior is wrong on a number of counts. Professor J. Michael Bailey himself noted in a newspaper article I read about the sex stimulation demonstration that the fact the event was a top news story for two days reveals a stark difference of opinion between people like me who see absolutely no harm and those who believe it was profoundly wrong. For him, it's only a question of harm that's at issue, not morality. It's not and never has been a case of morality or no morality, but rather which morality. The fundamental amoral nature of matter poses a profound logical problem for humanism. If we start with matter, and thus everything ultimately is matter, how do you get to morality? There's simply no logical way to get from statements of existence, this is, to ethical statements, this ought or ought not to be. The statements belong in different categories. A few years ago, a friend gave me an article from the journal Political Science. It was entitled Power, Principles and Democracy. The author, Leslie Lipson, uh, was addressing the dilemma of ethics in a democracy. Are they determined by majority vote? I thought he defined the problem quite well in the first two pages. Rather than contrast descriptive statements or statements of existence with ethical statements as I have, he talked of quantity and quality being distinct categories which do not necessarily correlate. He said, It's significant that the two greatest precursors of modern thinking about democracy both failed at this same hurdle to make the leap in their reasoning from power, quantity, to morality, quality. The two referred to being John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Lipsum identified exactly the problem I've outlined, though using different words. However, it wasn't only Locke and Rousseau that failed at this hurdle, but Lipsum himself didn't clear it. After outlining the problem quite well at the start of the article, for the next 13 pages he ignored the problem he had set out to solve. And then suddenly, at the end, back come ethics out of thin air and without any justification. Some have called this process mystification. You dispense with your problem by ignoring it and so blithely carry on as though it doesn't exist. A type of self-deception, an elephant in the room that's never acknowledged. Virtually our whole society is running on such mystification in regards to ethics and morality. There's constant talk of ethics without any acknowledgement of a foundation for them. They're just assumed. Talkback shows, at least in New Zealand, are what they are because of ethical dilemmas. Round and round in circles the callers go, but rare is it to hear anyone cut the knot and expose the roots of the problem. And even if someone does, the show carries on as though it hadn't happened. This is the root problem for a secular society in regards to ethics. By denying the creator, it has no adequate foundation for ethics and thus for law. I call this question of amorality the soft underbelly of humanism. How do you catch a crocodile? Of course, you take a knife to his armor-plated back. 
No, you don't. You grab his tail, flip him on his back, which exposes his soft underbelly, and stick him when he's vulnerable. Well, that's how I did it last time anyway. No one can consistently live amorally because it's a moral universe and we're moral creatures. That's the way God made us and we can't change it. It's just the way we are. The moment a humanist makes a moral statement, and they make them all the time, they're being inconsistent with their philosophical base of materialism. But it's actually worse than this. They usually make moral statements which other people are expected to understand without explanation and conform to. By doing this, they're acknowledging a standard outside of themselves, a higher law, which they think we all know about. But for them, there is no standard, let alone one that's outside of human beings, which requires obedience from each of us, least of all them. A classic illustration of this inconsistency came up in the homosexual law reform debate in New Zealand in 1985-86. The homosexuals at one stage had a slogan, support law reform just because it's just. Catchy phrase, but what does it mean? Justice presupposes a transcendent standard, a higher law. What standard? Where is it? On the basis of this higher law they appealed to, they passed judgment on and condemned the then current law of New Zealand and wanted it changed to suit their desires, an outcome they achieved. So the higher law wasn't the law of the land, but one higher still. However, the higher law that provides the basis for real justice condemns homosexual acts, the very thing these people wanted to legitimize. They wanted the higher law for propaganda purposes, but not as a law telling them how they should behave. Another illustration of this inconsistency was the media hysteria over the nomination of Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court of America a number of years ago. I saw on American television news that one thing his opponents had against him was that he believed in a higher law, a law above the American Constitution. Clearly his opponents didn't, and yet they tried to make him out to be an immoral man. On what basis? On the basis of an assumed but unidentified higher law, for goodness sake. In the comments to one of my YouTube videos, I was discussing this issue of morality requiring a higher law to give meaning to our moral judgments. And I was rubbished, because as I was told, everyone has their own moral compass which determines how they live. Over several exchanges, I noted that such a view could not determine whether giving to charity or giving your life for another was better or worse than murder, rape and mayhem, because there was no external standard to provide a basis for making the distinction. That if my moral compass told me that murder and rape were moral for me, then they were, no matter what anyone else said. Whatever I chose was moral, and thus objective right and wrong lost their meaning. I was told my comments were absurd, that everyone had their own moral compass, and most people did not murder and rape. I responded the numbers were irrelevant, and that if our moral compass was not orientated to a moral magnetic north, a higher law, then the needle of our moral compass could point in any direction, with none of them, or all of them, being correct. In fact, the idea of correct doesn't even come into it. The humanist moral position can thus be used to justify any kind of action. Everything is allowable. Anything goes. The compass needle can indeed point any which way. Moral statements are simply statements of preference, on the same level as saying what flavour ice cream you like. I heard an Australian author, psychoanalyst, New Ager interviewed on radio. Her latest book was encouraging the living of the grand old virtues, which sounded promising. Though the interviewer was not philosophically very sharp, when they came to the virtue of fidelity, he did actually ask her what she meant by it. Well, I'm not meaning necessarily that if you're married, you stay with your partner. At times, the faithful thing to do would be to leave, to be faithful to yourself. So you're faithful if you stay, and you're faithful if you leave. You make words mean what you want them to mean. Some don't like it when this sort of thing is publicly exposed. If a Christian exposes it, they'll be called all sorts of names. Absolutist, fascist, neo-Nazi, far-right, Ayatollah. Perhaps you may have even been called a fundamentalist. 
Well, those are all names I've been called. Actually, these days it's unlikely you'll be called an Ayatollah because of the past now being given Islam by the left, the politically correct, relativistic co-belligerence with Islam in the course against Christianity and Western civilization. If it's a world of chance, which is spontaneously developing, there can be no goal or direction or meaning to existence, hence the word meaningless in the diagram. Think back to the jigsaw with all the pieces scattered around. If we're to be consistent within the humanist worldview, we must approach this puzzle with the view that basically it's meaningless. There's no picture on any box anywhere to tell us if the pieces go together and what the individual pieces mean. The pieces themselves don't give us this information. If they did, giving us clues of a picture that transcends the individual pieces, that would speak of a transcendent jigsaw manufacturer. But such an idea is heresy in today's secular culture. To bring God into the equation is out of the question. You can't allow a divine foot in the door. So the jigsaw is looked at and declared meaningless. This obviously brings a whole raft of problems, but it's thought better to live with insoluble problems than to solve them through the acknowledgement of a maker. If existence is at root meaningless, then pessimism is the logical attitude to have toward it, and this leads to despair. The finale to a meaningless existence is death, the full stop at the end of life which equates to annihilation, the cessation of the individual's existence. Once you're dead, you're dead. It's more comforting to think you'll face oblivion than that you'll face your maker. That no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave. That all the labours of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the fast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. The picture of gears and cogs and the words mechanistic and deterministic represent another aspect, an inconsistency on the dark side of humanism. On the one hand, every individual event is seen to have occurred randomly, i.e. random chemical, atomic, subatomic interactions. On the other, in whole and in part, the universe is seen to be a gigantic machine, hence mechanistic. Every event determined by the machine as it grinds relentlessly on. In a mechanistic universe, there's no place for humans other than as machines, nor for any of the things that have been deemed the most valuable amongst humans. Love and relationships, morals and justice, creativity across the board, all of the arts, and religious philosophical thought. In a deterministic, materialistic universe, thought is determined by the electrochemical functions of the brain. And so no proposition, not even the proposition that the world is deterministic, means anything. In other words, the philosophy of determinism shoots itself in the foot, is suicidal, is self-refuting. The impression I have is that the dark side of humanism is avoided by most humanists except perhaps rap singers who I'm told glory in suicide in the dark. Most are gutless when it comes to this, though ironically they seem to hold in esteem the likes of the late Dr. Stephen Jay Gould, who are brave through being prepared to give some voice to the dark side. Those who dwell in and on the dark end up committing suicide. I went to a lecture by British evolutionary high priest and materialist Richard Dawkins, one of the leading braves 
The person during the question time asked, Professor Dawkins, after reading your books, could you please tell me why I should get up in the morning? He replied, Some people accuse me of being unnecessarily pessimistic. In fact, a teacher in New Zealand wrote to me and said how one of his students had read one of my books and decided life wasn't worth living. To a person like the student, there seems no point to anything. And from a humanistic point of view, they're right. The humanistic counsellor, or even a Richard Dawkins, who seeks to talk them out of suicide by suggesting that life really is worth living because of your kids, your career, your valuable, or because you can play golf or tiddlywinks, is the inconsistent one of the two. The counsellors trying to get the candidate for suicide to join the let's pretend that life has meaning and value game, whereas the person ready to kill themselves can see the game is a fraud. Many kids today can see the fraud. And yet programs are set up and mega bucks are spent trying to convince them life's worthwhile. Seldom do such programs deal with the guts of the issue. Normally they fluff around trying to give the kids a good self-esteem, as if they don't already have it. But if life is meaningless, why should feeling good about yourself be preferred to feeling bad about yourself? A lot of activity of people can be understood as an endeavour to put out of mind this chasm of meaninglessness that lurks in the background, threatening to destroy them. If they can just fill their life with various goals they set themselves to achieve, and if they can work it right and slip from goal to goal, or activity to activity, without too much gap between them, they'll be able to get right through life without having to think about the bleakness and the blackness they're surrounded by. Or perhaps they drink themselves into oblivion, or shoot themselves into ecstasy, or entertain themselves without end to avoid having to face their own meaninglessness. On a larger scale, a lot of the activity of any given nation or civilization can also be accounted for in the same way. The endeavor to make a name for ourselves, to carve out a place of significance or permanence, to provide a bootstrap meaning for us. And so we build monuments to our achievements, like the pyramids of Egypt, which have turned to dust in the same manner as the bodies they contain. Futility writ large, often at enormous public expense. In the light of this, what's the point of education? If everything is ultimately meaningless, then education is a charade without a meaning. We play the game, and yet there's no word to solve. I made a poster as a discussion starter for universities which says, if truth is relative, what's the point of exams? It's the story of the emperor's new clothes all over again. We have this enormous edifice of the educational establishment, but the purpose of it all has slipped away without anyone noticing. Or if they have, they self-censor and refrain from comment for fear they'll bring the whole lot tumbling down. Those who do speak up are ignored or told in no uncertain terms to shut up. In 2008, I gave a speech in an election educational forum for local candidates standing in the New Zealand general election. This forum was attended mainly by educational establishment people, principals of kindergartens, primary, secondary schools, teachers, and tertiary institute heads. But also in attendance were a number of present and past members of parliament and the local mayor. Each candidate was given 10 minutes, ample time, I thought, for me to point out the elephant in the room, which I did. My presentation, predictably, was a total freak in the proceedings and went down like a lead balloon. Not because it was, but because I was challenging the whole basis of secular education. The meeting carried on after I'd finished as though I'd never spoken, which was no surprise, as I understood precisely what I was doing and how it would be received. Generally, no place is even allowed for this sort of contribution. But I had the floor by right, and I put the challenge on the table, whether it was welcome or not, and filmed it for the record. And that's the malaise. Taught in various ways from the bottom to the top of the education system is the idea that life, the universe and everything is the result of blind, impersonal, purposeless, amoral forces. Thus, we're not the creation of a personal moral creator. 
and are thus not subject to any rules such a creator may have set for our behavior. There's no higher law or higher lawgiver. We are the lawmakers and we will make any law we like. And on this basis, Parliament legalized prostitution, making it just another service industry, like selling hamburgers or teaching. In fact, the teacher up north understood that seeing prostitution was legal, she could legitimately do it as a second job. For four years at Onslow College, I did woodwork and tech drawing, and then the careers advisors arranged for me to visit a number of building outfits to see if I liked the idea of becoming a builder. Building is a valid service industry for students to train and find employment in. So now that prostitution has joined building as a valid service industry, why shouldn't prostitution classes be run at high schools like technology classes are? And why should career advisors not arrange trips to brothels for aspiring prostitutes? In a Darwinian world, the type of world presupposed throughout most of the educational sector in New Zealand and explicitly promoted by Gould and other such luminaries, no valid objection can be raised. On talkback radio after the teacher prostitute story broke, discussion of the morality of the situation was minimized and on at least one occasion I heard explicitly excluded. It's not unusual. Talk of morality is excluded from the table in virtually all public discussion in our culture. Why is that? Because as soon as you allow morality in, you acknowledge a higher law and a higher law giver. But as evolutionary biologist Richard Lewontin said, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. With a divine foot in the door, the room is turned upside down and everything is different, including education. It's as though winter has broken, spring has arrived, and the sun is shining on a world vibrant and pulsating with meaning and purpose and stunning technicolor. Parents who have higher aspirations for their children than for them to be taught on a religious philosophical foundation of meaninglessness, or for them to be guinea pigs in politically motivated social engineering experiments, or subject to fraudulent environmental propaganda, or exposed to child abusers peddling the corrupting ideology of sexual pervert Alfred Kinsey, should not be con compelled to accept lower standards than they desire. They should be free and enabled to choose an education consistent with their aspirations for their children. Mm -hmm.